Yeah, buddy! What's going on, guys? VC Amplified. It's the second biggest party of the WWE year, and it's the biggest party of the summer for WWE. That means it's SummerSlam weekend. SummerSlam is finally almost upon us. That means this is Amplified booking for SummerSlam 2017. For those of you new to how Amplified booking works, that's just me running down every single match and talking about it as if I was booking and creating each match. What would I do during each match? and for each match to make it the most exciting, the most fun, and the most intriguing uh, to the audience. And then what we do is we sit back, we watch what WWE actually produces this Sunday, and then we determine who was better. Was little old BC's booking much better and creative input, or did WWE put on a better show than BC would have? So it's a fun thing we like to do on the channel. And uh, you know how we treat SummerSlam in this household, guys. We treat it just like WrestleMania, a national holiday, which means we get festive, we celebrate it. Now, Fred the Sun was supposed to pop up earlier, but instead, we got nothing but rain clouds, and Fred has not shown up. So, uh, that sucks. We want Fred! We want Fred! Hopefully, guys, Fred shows up in a little bit, because we got other guests like Palm Tree Polly, right? Or as I call him, Polly Palm Nuts. All right, you guys remember Polly Walnuts from The Sopranos? Well, this is Polly Palm Nuts. Polly the Palm Tree! He's gonna be here all weekend, guys, so special guest, Polly the Palm Tree. Um, and so yeah, we're gonna go through every fucking match starting with the kickoff show. Alright guys, so first the kickoff show matches, there's three because one just got added last night because that's all we need is another fucking match, A, and B, another fucking useless match. First of all, check out my fucking palm trees on my fucking dome piece. Fuck yeah! That'll be distracting though, so I gotta take that shit off, but how fucking cool, palm trees on my fucking head! Anyway guys. Jason Jordan and the Hardy Boys versus the Miz Why the fuck? We just saw this a few days ago and nobody knew why we were seeing it then. Now you're going to put it on fucking SummerSlam? Now we all know this is just for a little quick match so that Jason Jordan and the Hardy Boys can celebrate afterwards and all the faces uh, celebrate and everyone's happy to start off the kickoff show. But what I would do, let's fucking make it meaningful and, and have a fucking way that the Miz can look strong. How about they actually win? Jason Jordan's already in the fucking dumps anyway. You're not going to save that guy unless you do something dramatically different with him. The Hardy Boys are, are going to be fucking fan favorites till they fucking are, are long gone from this fucking world. So there's no way you can even harm them with a loss or even a, a million losses. The Mistras have the most to lose here. Let them win. In fact, let Bo Dallas or Curtis Axel actually pick up the pinfall over Jeff Hardy or Matt Hardy. Let's let, let them get some fucking steam. Let the Mistras be something. I think they can be. Let's start it, you know, not, don't look at it like a useless match. Let's look at this as, hey, a fucking, finally, the Mishraz is going in the right direction. They're actually getting some momentum behind them. So, I wouldn't use this as a little bit of a squash. I would use this as a good opportunity to show everybody that the Mishraz is for real. The next match I would have is the Cruiserweight Championship, Tazawa versus Neville. Now, what I would have at the end of this match is Titus O'Neil distract the referee, Apollo Crews gets on the apron and decks Tazawa. This leads to Neville's finisher, one, two, three, Neville picks up the championship, new cruiserweight champion, all because of Titus O'Neil and Apollo Crews? Why the fuck did they do that? Well, luckily, I'm glad you asked, because Titus has the answer. Titus grabs the mic, looks over a passed out Tazawa, knocked out Tazawa, and he says, sometimes in business, you gotta upgrade. You've just been upgraded, kid. Titus Worldwide upgrades. Tazawa is an absolute fucking bum anyway, let's be honest. He puts me to fucking sleep every time he is on. Can he put on okay matches and even decent matches and sometimes good matches? Yeah, most likely. Maybe I've even seen a couple, but I wouldn't have remembered because he's so fucking boring. So Tazawa needs to get the fuck out of the, any type of spotlight. Tazawa with Cruz in Titus O'Neil automatically makes that whole faction, that whole group... That whole semi-stable, that it makes them irrelevant. He looks like he doesn't belong. He's so fucking annoying. He's boring. Ugh, 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 ugh. Whatever the fuck he does. You got about five ten-year-olds in the audience that scream it back to you. Nobody knows what you're doing. Are you having a medical emergency when you scream like that? Should we be calling 911 or can we just get you the fuck off of our TV sets? So Tazawa needs to fucking go anyway. Neville with Apollo Crews. That's a formidable, formidable pair right there, guys. Neville and Apollo Crews under Titus O'Neil's jurisdiction. Under his guidance. Now you have the makings of an actual, legit faction. A little stable that you could even add on. And by the way, yes, 
I would add Dana Brooke into that stable in the future. They already kind of hinted at that in some uh, backstage interviews for WWE.com. You guys could check that out. Titus O'Neil and Dana Brooke and Dana kind of hinting like maybe she should join Titus, uh, Titus, Titus's brand worldwide, whatever the fuck it's called. But imagine that, man. You got Neville, Apollo Crews, Titus, and Dana Brooke starting an actual stable that actually means something. Them in the Miztourage can both be cemented, and it's all on the kickoff show of all things. But both factions could have a little bit of some momentum if they actually put some input and some creativity into it on the kickoff show. But Tazawa, you gots to go. As Titus says, you've been upgraded, kid. And then we end the kickoff show with the New Day and the Usos. This should be a straight-up match. <clears throat> Excuse me. Fucking, uh, we're on the kickoff show and I'm already fucking getting choked up about it. The New Day and the Usos should be a straight-up match. Because, guys, uh, they put on really good matches with each other. And it's the third pay-per-view in a row. We, we need, uh, you know, actual definitive winners here. No outside interference. No schmazes. No bullshit. Usos pick up the win and new tag team champions. That's right. Now, I know... The Usos just beat the New Day this past Tuesday night, so that will tell you what WWE is most likely going to do is have the New Day keep their championships. But this is about them. This is about my booking. I would have the Usos pick up the championships because... No! No, I'm playing. Um, because the Usos right now are playing their best characters, especially as heels. This, I believe, is the Usos' best run in WWE. They really have to put some momentum behind them because... The Usos are putting on their best promos. They're really into these heel characters. They're putting on some of the best matches that they have in their career. Put them on one last huge run for the Usos. New champions. Let's see where they fucking rock it off to. Uh, the New Day is going to save face here. The New Day, you could do so much with them if they lose. The Usos, be honest, guys. What can you do with the Usos if they lose against New Day this Sunday on the kickoff show? Where do the Usos go? They, they're not going to fight the New Day anymore because this is the third pay-per-view in a row. This feud has been going on way too long. It's over with. Where do the Usos go? Exactly. The New Day you can do a bunch of shit with. But the Usos, no. They need to really be fucking a relevant team. And they can be. Put the straps on them and let them be in those high-profile spotlighted matches. So the Usos pick up the championships, and that's a straight match, guys. No bullshit, outside interference, no trickery, nothing. Straight out, they beat the Usos. One, two, three. All right, guys, so I had to turn the fucking hat around now. I'm already starting to sweat, and I still got like, what the fuck, man? I got like 10 more matches to go here. But the good news is we've reached the main card, right? The SummerSlam show itself. We're no longer in the kickoff show. I would start it out with John Cena with a bang. Now, we don't know if there's going to be fireworks because WWE is so fucking cheap that they let go of the fireworks a long time ago. Who knows if they would splurge for the second biggest party of the year in their biggest party of the summer. But I started out with John Cena and Baron Corbin. I want this match to be really good. We should be seeing the best of Baron Corbin. However, at the very end, it's John Cena that picks up the victory. Yes, guys, because... Baron Corbin, he just suffered his fucking most embarrassing loss, most likely of his whole career. The next 10 to 15 years, no matter what happens, that's probably going to be the most embarrassing moment for Baron Corbin. You might as well ride that out one more fucking match because it's, it's not even going to be a full week by the time that embarrassing moment is fucking out of our mind, right? That was Tuesday. This Sunday, that's, you're literally talking five days later. You might as well have Baron Corbin drop this. John Cena is going to Raw most likely after this. You can't have John Cena going to Raw with a loss to Baron Corbin. That's unfinished business. But what I would do right after Cena beats Baron Corbin, you can actually have it be two AAs that has to get the job done. I'm fine with that. But Baron Corbin fucking snaps afterwards. Dex John Cena, end of days. This will create a little bit of booze. And you can see that fucking Baron Corbin has a little bit of an edge to him. And he's not fucking going to take it anymore. But then Baron Corbin goes to leave the ring. He goes up the ramp, but then he stops. He looks back. The crowd's thinking, oh shit, he's coming back. And sure enough, he is. He goes back in the ring. Boom! Second end of days to John Cena. This garners even more boos. Baron Corbin kind of looks at the crowd like, I don't give a fuck if you're booing me. And then he leaves the ring. He goes up the ramp, but then he stops. He turns again. Now this is really garnering the fans' attention. Oh shit, is he coming back again? Corbin goes back. A third end of days. John Cena is totally knocked the fuck out. And this time, Baron Corbin is just kneeling over Cena, but staring a hole through the crowd. Crowd is now erupting in a lot more fucking booze. This sh will show you. This is how you save Baron Corbin's face, even by losing the John Cena. This 
will let us all know, wham, it happened. Baron Corbin has finally snapped. We thought the Money in the Bank briefcase thing was going to be the, the, the straw that broke the Baron's back, but it's the John Cena loss. It's, it's the whole week, the horrible week for Baron Corbin. First the briefcase incident, and then days later losing to John Cena, that's it. He finally went fucking, he snapped. And at three end of days, knocked fucking John Cena totally out, and he's looking at the crowd like a fucking madman. We have just witnessed the new Baron Corbin. And then Tuesday on SmackDown, you have to follow up with that and start the Baron Corbin push, this time the right way. You don't need a championship on him to push him. You don't need a briefcase, that's all right. You can build Baron by the most important thing you need as a wrestler. The character. The character. Even more than wrestling skills, right? I'm sure you could say that about fucking Giant Gonzalez and he made it to the big time. Yoko fucking Zuna. But as long as you have a character and you can relate to the fucking audience, shit, if you can do a big boot and a choke slam, you could be a pro wrestler. So Baron Corbin can be built up. Just give him the right character. A loss to John Cena, I think, is the right way to go about this. You're not going to have him lose the briefcase in like a two-second roll-up match with Jinder Mahal and then have him beat John Cena at SummerSlam? No, that's not going to make people go, oh, he's relevant again, or oh, Baron's back on track. No, it's going to go to, okay, that's unbelievable. That's literally unbelievable. Like, not believable. Anyway, that's the first match. John Cena picks up the win. Baron Corbin, we finally see Baron's new character after the match. The second match of the main card for SummerSlam, I'm excited about. Demon, Balor, Bray Wyatt. I want you to give them enough time, WWE. Let them show you what they could do because Bray and Demon Balor, they can have a great match with each other if you give them the time. I want the match to be really good. I want at the end, Demon Balor defeats Bray Wyatt. I know, I hate Bray Wyatt losing at all these pay-per-views, but this makes the most sense because I got something special planned. Demon Balor picks up the win. And by the way, you can't let Demon Balor, it's something special. It's the first time we're seeing him back in the WWE. You can't have him just lose up front. He wins the match, but then all of a sudden, and I want Bray Wyatt to kind of be up as he's celebrating and Demon Balor's music is playing and Demon Balor's uh, doing a little celebration. Bray Wyatt's kind of in the turnbuckle, kind of shoulder into the turnbuckle. He's starting to come to, he realizes what's going on, what's happening. And I want his scream and the lights go out. You know that weird fucking Bray Wyatt scream and then the lights go out. Demon Balor's music shuts. When the lights go on, Nikki Cross is at the bottom of the ramp staring into the ring, a hole through Demon Balor. Bray Wyatt's got a smile on his face. Demon Balor's confused as fuck. Nikki Cross is just staring like a demented fucking woman that she is, character-wise. But then the, the, the Wyatt scream happens again and the lights go out again. This time... Sanity's music plays. That's right. All of Sanity comes down the rampway. They meet up with Nikki Cross. They get up on the apron. They surround Demon Balor. Demon Balor doesn't know where to look. Boom. Bray Wyatt decks him from behind. All of Sanity gets in the ring and jump Demon Balor like a pack of wolves. Like a pack of hounds. Beating Demon Balor. Almost lifeless. Definitely motionless. And at the end, they pick Sanity picks up Demon Balor. And they start ushering him up the rampway toward the back. And Bray Wyatt is basically the conductor of this. And Sanity, you got Bray Wyatt in the front conducting. Sanity's lifting him up. You got Nikki Cross following behind looking like a fucking demented woman. Sanity and Wyatt have this weird connection. And then it's like you have to tune into Raw now. You have to. Because if nothing else, to, to see where Sanity and Wyatt and where that weird relationship goes to, if nothing else... You have to see what happened to Demon Balor. He just really, for all intent and purposes, got kidnapped. That's intriguing, man. That's how you create intrigue and excitement. That's a fun way to end that Demon Balor and Bray Wyatt match. And it's the debut of Sanity. Uh, because again, guys, I just do not see the Authors of Pain getting the nod now. It was originally going to be Authors of Pain in my booking. Like, coming up to the roster, I would have had them somewhere else on the card. But to me, it makes more sense to lit... Authors of Pain, leave the titles on them in NXT. Let them grow more. Let them dominate more. Let Sanity come over. Because Sanity, they can't do anything else in NXT. Their time is really up. Let's be honest. Sanity has done all they can as far as NXT's boundaries. But you could do so much fun, cool shit with Demon Balor and Sanity slash Wyatt. That's a fun fucking mix, guys. And I would have Demon Balor do the Demon Balor gimmick and character through No Mercy. That's the very next pay-per-view, September 24th. So I realize you can't have Demon Balor all the time. After No Mercy, 
then you can stop the character you, you, for the next four months, all the way to Royal Rumble. Even Survivor Series, you could have Club Balor. But Demon Balor has to fucking show up and have a good storyline with Sanity through No Mercy. That's what I would have. But that's a fun uh, second match for sure. The third match, we have to bring it down a little bit, right? Because uh, we kind of had some excitement there with fucking Baron Corbin going ape shit on John Cena. And then we had Sanity, Nikki Cross fucking showing up out of nowhere. So let's bring it down a little bit. And bringing it down isn't really bringing it down. The crowd's going to be really fucking hyped to see Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. But that would be my third match. Ambrose and Rollins versus tag team champion Cesaro and Sheamus. Just like the SmackDown Championship on the kickoff show, the same with the Raw Championship. There is no need to overbook this match. I'm overbooking all the other matches as it is, most of them. So I don't need to overbook this. Let's bring it down. We have new tag team champions, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. Uh, I don't care how it gets done. I really don't care about how the match goes. It could be a sucky match for all I care. It could be a six-minute match. I don't care if they just sit in the ring, Ambrose and Rollins, and fist pump each other for ten minutes until they really, 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 really trust each other. I don't give a fuck. I don't care if Sheamus and Cesaro look really bad in their loss. The end result has to be Rollins and Ambrose pick up the win and, most importantly, pick up the championships. And why? Because I have a plan for them later, and I think you guys know where I'm going with that. But that would be the third match of the night for me. New tag team champions, Ambrose and Rollins. Now, fourth match. I would go for the Women's SmackDown Championship. Naomi the champion versus Natalia. This match, I want Natalia to bring her A game. Because we know Naomi's going to. I want this to be a decent match. Give them at least 10 minutes, guys. This should not be a 7 minute fucking stupid bullshit match. 10 minutes at least. I would love to see 15 between these two. We know they've been working together for 7 fucking years. So they should be able to put on a really good match. Do it this Sunday. No talking. Just do it. At the end of this match, I have Naomi keeping her championship. Almost like Baron Corbin and John Cena, I want Natalia to jump Naomi afterwards and be totally pissed off. Get her in the sharpshooter. I want Naomi facing the rampway. As the sharpshooter is on, Carmella's music hits. Crowd goes a little bit nutty because we know what's happening. Carmella is cashing in her Money in the Bank briefcase. So we think. She goes over to the timekeeper. The referee's out there with the ring announcer, the timekeeper. Carmella's trying to give her the case. James Ellsworth is out there. Natalia's kind of got the sharpshooter still, and she's looking back at Carmella like, Bitch, what you doing? This is my moment. And that's when Becky Lynch hits the ring. No music. Becky Lynch just hits the ring. Because remember, this past Tuesday on SmackDown, Naomi saved Becky Lynch when she was in the sharpshooter. So story-wise, this belongs. Becky Lynch comes in. Natalia wants no part of it. Natalia sees Becky Lynch and rolls right out. Natalia is now joining Carmella, the referee, the ring announcer, the timekeeper, all over at the timekeeper area. They're all over there now. And they're, they want Becky Lynch out of the ring because Carmella wants to cash in. So Carmella, James Ellsworth is yelling for Becky to get out of the ring. The ref is yelling at Carmella, do you want to do this? Carmella's telling the ref, get her out, get her out. She's not supposed to be there. Ronda Rousey comes out of nowhere and decks Becky Lynch from behind. Absolutely knocking her out. Forearm to the back of her head. At this point, Carmella, Natalia, everybody is stunned. Natalia... I want Ronda Rousey staring at all of them. Staring at Naomi, who's still passed out from the sharpshooter. Staring at Becky Lynch, who she, she, she just knocked out. Staring at Carmella and Natalia outside. Staring at all the females, like putting them all on notice. Ronda Rousey showing up in Brooklyn at SummerSlam. The crowd, at this point, is going fucking ballistic. They don't care about no fucking cash-in at that point. And that's a good way to save face and have them not disappointed that there was no cash-in. Because in BC Amplified's booking, you do not cash-in at SummerSlam. Everybody expects that. Don't cash-in when everyone expects it. What makes the Money in the Bank briefcase so special is when we don't expect it and the music hits. Where they show up and they hand over the briefcase. That's special. It's gotten to the point now where somebody's getting the briefcase and we're all like speculating. Like, yep, this is where she's cashing in. We all thought it with Baron Corbin, right? Baron Corbin's cashing in this Sunday. That's not special or fun anymore. Now we all think Carmella's going to cash in Sunday. I don't want to see that then. It's got to be special. Now this is a good way to really have the most anticipation and most enthusiastic ending while still having the briefcase on Carmella. Because as Ronda's staring at everybody, Natalia, Carmella, and even Ellsworth, they're like backpedaling. They're going around the ring and they start backpedaling up the ramp like I want no part of fucking Ronda. Crowd will still be going ecstatic and we cut to a promo like a WWE Network or some shit, but... 
Ronda Rousey makes her WWE debut in my booking at SummerSlam, knocks out Becky Lynch, and this will help. You could go further with the Four Horsemen storyline, Four Horsewomen storyline, with Sasha Banks, Charlotte, Becky Lynch, and Bailey, and Ronda Rousey and her gals. And we already know Shayna Baszler is down in NXT right now, so the second woman's already ready to go as well. So, and that could even be down the line. This could just be planting the seeds. Ronda takes out one of the horsewomen. It makes total sense, and it makes total fucking awesome pay-per-view TV, baby. Goosebumps! Like, Paulie, you good? You need another coffee? Alright, we're gonna hit up fucking Starbucks after this video and get some big-ass lattes. But we're gonna bring it down now. We just had Ronda Rousey. The crowd just went fucking ballistic. Now what we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna go to Cass and Big Show. Enzo Amore in a shark cage high above. Now, this is where I'm going to have Gallows and Anderson come out, distract the referee. The, now, the referee being distracted is going to cause Big Show to be distracted because he's a big goof, and that makes sense. But this is where the problem lies. Enzo was dropping a chain down to the ring, and because Big Show was distracted, Big Cass ended up getting it. Cass ends up decking in his dome piece the Big Show twice with that chain. Cass throws the chain out, and then a big boot to Big Show's face. One, two, three... Cass wins the match. Afterwards, Gallows and Anderson and Cass pretty much boot Big Show right out of the ring. And then they all stare up to Enzo. This is where we know Enzo's in trouble. They start lowering the cage of Enzo. It's kind of fitting, right? The, the cage is called a shark cage. But it's Enzo who's about to be fed to the, to the fucking sharks. And the sharks are Gallows, Anderson, and Big fucking Cass. Now, once that fucking cage, and you could see fucking Enzo the whole time is like, oh, I am so fucking fucked. And you're right, you are pretty fucked. But once that cage hits the actual ring and touches bottom, Gold Dust's music hits. That's right, Gold Dust. You're thinking, BC, where the fuck is this booking going? Gold Dust? Hear me out. Summer Ray comes down the ramp in a fucking glitzing fucking gold dress. Just fucking bedazzling the shit out of Brooklyn. And she gets in the ring. The, the Gold Dust theme ends. Summer Rae's in the ring. Gallows, Anderson, and Cass are all pretty much staring at her like, what the fuck? They lost focus of Enzo at this point. Gold Dust comes from, under, from underneath the ring. From under the bottom rope on the other side. Enters ring. Let's fucking Enzo out of the cage. Low blows Gallows in his how you doings. Gallows falls like a ton of bricks. Enzo jumps Anderson. Goldust jumps Cass. Cass is pretty much down and out after just a couple of blows. I mean, Cass just had a fight with Big Show. And here you have Goldust, a seasoned veteran who's got this renowned sense of who, he, who the fuck he is. And who Goldust is. You know, he's got this new sense of Mojo. Not Mojo Rowley, but Mojo in the form of Goldust's epic fucking badass self that he once was. That is back and Cass was feeling the effects of it. Anderson got fucking beat up by the Chihuahua. That is Enzo. I mean, Ch fucking Enzo will hump your leg until you have to run away. So that's Anderson. So that's totally believable, man. And you have Goldust and Enzo in the middle of the ring. Big Show can even get back in and they can help Big Show up maybe. But this makes sense, guys, because Goldust was looking for a co-star. He said that this Monday. He said he's going to be at SummerSlam and he's, it's time for him to find a co-star. Almost like that's when Goldust was at his peak was with Marlena. They work so good together. Goldust needs a manager like that. Goldust needs somebody by his side for one last big run for Goldust. Summer Rae, I feel, is the perfect person for that job. I think them two together would be a fun ride. And I think at No Mercy, a Cass versus Goldust feud leading up to No Mercy and then a Hollywood backlot brawl. We haven't really seen one until since Rowdy Piper and Goldust. And I fucking loved that. That was at WrestleMania 12. Now, yeah, it got mixed reviews and all that bullshit. But you know what? A lot of wrestling fans fucking absolutely loved it like myself. And, and you know what? They just had a fuck was it? The Haunted Horror fucking match with Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton. If you can do that, you can give me a Hollywood backlot brawl again. So... In honor of Roddy Piper, we do it again, and this time, Cass versus Goldust. They're going to be in Los Angeles for no mercy. Let's do a Hollywood backlap for all, man, and let's really raise Cass's star power, and let's give Goldust one last big run. Makes total fucking sense. It would be fun, man, and to see Summer Rae and Goldust, that would be something new. Um, now, next, what I would do, guys, where do you guys want to go, man? I would do... Randy Orton and Rusev is what I would do because the final four matches after that, 
I want it to be bang, 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 bang in your face. I don't want no downtime. You know how WWE usually before their big main event, they put on some stupid five minute match beforehand so everybody can calm down before the, the WWE wants them to get hyped for the main event. So usually in the past, it was uh, women usually because WWE never gave a fuck about the women. So they just had them go on before the main event, gave them about five to seven minutes. Crowd didn't give a shit. And that never works. Never fucking works. Especially most of these pay-per-views lately, they don't give a fuck about the main event. So what I'm going to do in my booking, I'm going to stack the end of this pay-per-view. I'm going to stack SummerSlam 2017 at the end. In your face, main event caliber matches. What that means is next I would have Rusev and Orton. Rusev and Orton, this is simple, guys. This is going to be one of the funnest matches of the night. Because I would have Rusev, literally, right when the bell rings, super kick to Orton. Orton drops like a ton of bricks. Accolade! Orton passes out after like 30, 45 seconds in the accolade. So in just about a minute's time, Orton loses this match to Rusev in total squash fashion. This kills a lot of birds with one stone, guys. If you think about it, this would make Rusev look like the beast that he was always supposed to be booked as, but never was because they didn't know how to fucking book this, this fucking guy. And he's a talent. Trust me. Rusev looks like a badass. Orton can totally press the reset button here. He's totally been getting beat by Jinder Mahal non-fucking-stop as it is. He had one victory in the middle of a fucking... Or the main event of SmackDown Live. But what the fuck does that matter? Nobody gave a shit. This could be a reset for Orton. And this could lead to many different character development changes for Orton. But what you cannot do is have Orton defeat Rusev. That because Rusev just came back from injury and he lost to John Cena at the last pay-per-view for SmackDown. Battleground. So what the fuck are you... Are you honestly going to make him lose against Orton just because Orton did the deed for Jinder Mahal? So now Rusev has to suffer another humiliating fucking defeat because that's what it is at this point. This guy gets a whole these months off, comes back, and he's even more of a jobber now than he was before. No. Let's make Rusev. It's time for Orton to really pay the fucking due. Rusev in a squash match defeats Randy Orton, super kick to the face, accolade, in a one minute's time Randy Orton's defeated, the crowd in Brooklyn would be like, what the fuck? Fucking awesome booking man, and by the way I said it'll kill many birds with one stone, it would pump up Rusev, it would allow Randy Orton to do a reset, but it would also save you time troubles, right? We already know that Vince McMahon is going to face time restraints, a lot of matches are going to have to be cut short that shouldn't be getting cut, cut short. So why not do the job there, man? Randy Orton, one minute, loses to Rusev. I fucking love that booking. And uh, that's one of my, uh, yeah, man, if only we could get that. Next, guys, you have AJ, because right, because that really brought it down, right? Now we're ready to see actual wrestling competition. AJ Styles takes on Kevin Owens, Shane McMahon special guest referee. This one is simplistic. Let Owens and AJ Styles do what they do best. Let them wrestle each other. The whole fucking match. You have some fun with Shane McMahon and all that hoopla. Yeah, it'll be fun, blah, blah, blah. But what you have to fucking do is let them wrestle. Now, what you're going to fucking do at the end? Simple. Kevin Owens is going to get in the face of Shane McMahon one too many times and actually shove McMahon. This is going to lead to McMahon putting his hands on Owens. That's going to lead to AJ Styles picking up the win. I don't care how it's done, but it's going to have some involvement with Shane McMahon. AJ Styles not only picks up the win, but he keeps his United States Championship. After the match, Kevin Owens is flipping the fuck out. And Shane McMahon is already up the rampway like, Hey, you did that to yourself, buddy. You can literally read his lips. AJ Styles is going up the ramp too with his championship. Owens is flipping out. Kind of like what Baron Corbin was doing this past Tuesday. Slamming the fucking uh, announced fucking TV sets, the announce booth. Kevin Owens is just fucking irate at this point. And that's it. Now, there's a little bit more between these two in a little bit. But for right then, that's how that match is ending. AJ Styles keeps his championship. And there is much dissension between Shane McMahon and Kevin Owens. That's going to lead to a lot more in just a bit. Right after that, guys, I would have Shinsuke Nakamura in a backstage interview. And I would have like a Renee Young or somebody ask him, what are your plans if the Singh brothers get involved? Or we know we've seen Great Khali show up at the last pay-per-view. Do you have any plans about this? Because Jinder Mahal has come out and said he, that his plans are to win by any means necessary. And Shinsuke is just going to, his answer is going to be simple. I also have friends here that are watching my back. How cool is that? So now we're thinking, who the fuck do you have watching you? What? And that's it. 
you go back to the ring, Sasha Banks' music hit, hits, and now we get Sasha Banks versus Alexa Bliss for the Women's Championship. No bullshit. No trickery. No overbooking this. I'm already overbooking most of this card. You don't need to overbook this. Sasha Banks becomes your new Raw Women's Champion in Brooklyn at SummerSlam, your second biggest pay-per-view in BC Amplified. Takes the deepest breath he's ever fucking taken while watching pro wrestling because finally, finally, what had to have happened, happened, man. Somebody that fucking deserved it on that type of a stage, Sasha got her championship. And it was straight. There was no bullshit. It was one, two, fucking three. Or it was the fucking bank statement. I personally, in my booking, I would make it the bank statement, have it a tap out. Man, fucking epic. Even have Bailey come in afterwards, a hug, a congratulations, a fucking party for Sasha Banks. If it was my, if I was booking the whole fucking thing, really, I would have fireworks, I would have the roof exploding, I would have fireworks all around New York City, the Empire State Building would lose the colors and just have a big photo of fucking Sasha Banks. Uh, the fucking Hudson River would be doing a, one big swirly fucking, fucking spell out the letters Sasha all on the Hudson. Sorry, Paulie. Uh, it would just be a fucking party, guys. Um... But I'll take a two to five minute celebration afterwards. Just leave the camera on her. You can even have Bailey come out. No heel turns. Sasha doesn't turn heel. Bailey does not show up and turns heel. You don't need that shit. Especially in my booking, it wouldn't make sense because I'm starting the seeds to our horsewomen versus horsewomen match for Survivor Series. That's months away, so it's going to be a slow build. But Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch started that. At some point in the future, you're going to see Bailey and Sasha Banks get involved in that. They have to be on the same team. So I would have no heel turns. And plus, I don't want anything stealing the spotlight from the spotlight where it should be on, which is Sasha fucking Banks with that fucking gold belt, the red, the white, whatever the fuck you want to call it, on her shoulder and eventually on her waist. Sasha Banks is your new Raw Wins champion, and I don't have to overbook that shit. That's the best part. Main event time. We're talking Jinder Mahal, right, double main event. Jinder Mahal... And Shinsuke Nakamura. This match, let them all do everything they have in their arsenal. Let this be a badass main event. And at the end, you have to have a Singh brother cause a distraction to the referee. The other Singh brother helps Jinder Mahal. The Colossus is put on because of the Singh brother. One, two, three. Jinder Mahal retains his championship, defeats Shinsuke Nakamura. Or so we think. Shane McMahon, who's still in his referee fucking shirt, actually, because just a couple of matches ago, he was involved in that AJ Styles-Kevin Owens match. He comes down to the ring. He comes running down there. And he says, absolutely not. This is the main event at SummerSlam. Second biggest pay-per-view for WWE. For SmackDown's main event, that's not how this is ending. There was interference. Absolutely not. Get them the fuck out. Restart this match. The Singh brothers are evacuated from the arena. They are kicked out, or at least ringside. And the match is restarted. Singh brothers, obviously, at that point, are kind of like, what? No. They're fucking, they haven't, they're not going to leave yet. You know, when people get kicked out, they kind of stick around for a minute, and they're like, what? No, let me argue a little bit. Let me look like I'm fucking really pissed. So, they're fucking kicked out, though. They just haven't left yet. And the match is restarted per order of Shane McMahon. This is fucking... Now, everyone's pissed. Obviously, the Singh brothers, they just got kicked out, so they're pissed off. Jinder Mahal is super pissed off because he just fucking won the match, thought he's retaining his championship, now the match has to continue. Shane McMahon goes to walk up the fucking rampway. Jinder Mahal decks Shinsuke Nakamura from behind, goes into the referee. So, Jinder hits Shinsuke, who hits the referee. Referee goes down. Shane McMahon is more than halfway up the ramp when he notices this. Singh brothers still have that left ring side. They were about to. Shane McMahon turns around. He goes to come back down the ramp because now there's no referee. But Kevin Owens comes out of nowhere from the rampway and decks Shane McMahon. Kevin Owens brings Shane McMahon over to the fucking tables that are set up next to the staging area. Power bomb Shane McMahon through the tables. While that's going on, the Singh brothers are obviously sticking around ringside. Get in the ring. The three of them put a beating on Shinsuke Nakamura. Shinsuke's able to fight off all three until, you know who, Great Kali 
comes down to the ring. Shinsuke's holding his own against three motherfuckers, Jinder and the Singh brothers. He doesn't see Kali behind him. Poor Shinsuke turns around right into Kali's fucking hands over his throat. Kali picks up Nakamura, slams him down to the mat. Nakamura's fucking down and out. The regroup of Kali, the Singh brothers, and Jinder Mahal. All four of them are standing over Shinsuke as the referee is still down. When all of a sudden, Hulk Hogan's music starts bursting out through fucking Brooklyn. The Barkley Center. Real American starts fucking jamming. Sure enough, there's the red and yellow coming down the ringside. At this point, Brooklyn has lost its fucking mind. We have not seen Hulk Hogan, I don't, I don't know how long, especially back in New York City at the Barkley Center. They're flipping the fuck out. But you got the Singh brothers, Jinder Mahal in the middle, and the great fucking Kali waiting for you. Shinsuke's already fucking out. What are you going to do, Hulk Hogan? Take on all fucking four of these men? One fucking three men and one giant? Boom. That's when the glass shatters. Stone Cold Steve Austin starts headed down the ringside. Steve Austin's got the crowd at this point going fucking bananas. Hogan and Austin. But Austin's a little bit reluctant too. Should we go in there now? Or should we wait for one other son of a bitch? If you smell, boom! This sets Brooklyn fucking electric. The Rock comes down the ringside. He meets up with Hogan, Austin. The first time we've seen Hogan, Austin, and The Rock together since WrestleMania 30, the opening to that WrestleMania 30 show. And that was electric. All three of them, at this point, the Singh brothers, fucking Mahal, and even Kali are like, what the fuck are we get ourselves into? Hogan hits the ring. Stone Cold hits the ring. The Rock hits the ring. They just start throwing fucking bows. They clear the ring to the point where literally Shinsuke is now up and Jinder is being fed to him. You have the fucking Shinkasa and boom, it is over with. One, two, three. When everyone clears the ring, the ref gets up. Hogan is actually the last one. I want Hogan to really wake him up. Once everyone clears and the referee counts three, you have a new world champion. I love my Jinder Mahal. But Shinsuke Nakamura wins the championship Sunday at SummerSlam and BC Amplified's booking. And in my booking, you keep that on Shinsuke for a while. Uh, you really build this rock star that you want. Yeah, Shinsuke, this is the time to do it. Everyone says Shinsuke's not ready. This and this and the other thing. No, he absolutely is. And what I want you to do after SummerSlam is you book him almost like Brock Lesnar. Not as absent, right? Brock has gone too much a lot of the times. But with Shinsuke... I don't want to see him every week on SmackDown. At least not wrestling. Make him special. He should be a special attraction. Not just like a Finn Balor and a Demon Balor. You know, I'll, I'll use my character once in a while. No. Shinsuke as a whole should be a special attraction, man, with that championship. That would be fucking epic. Now, now you go on right and You know, that's fucking, man. That's goosebumps, man. Shinsuke wins the championship celebrating with The Rock, Austin, and Hogan. If that's not a passing of the torch... If that's not getting the casual fan who didn't really know much about Na Nakamura into fucking Nakamura, I don't know what the fuck, would honestly do it for the casual fan. You have Rock, you have Austin, you have Hogan, and now you have the, the, you know, the passing of the torch, the new carrier of the flame, Shinsuke Nakamura. This would lead us, and man, we are so low on time, I have to unfortunately go fast in this main, main event, guys. I would have the four-way close out the show. Braun Strowman, Samoa Joe, Brock Lesnar, and Roman Reigns. I would have them literally beat the shit out of each other the whole match. Tables are going fucking ladders, chairs, ta you fucking name it, guys. They are going through it. The barriers, barricades, fighting into the stands. At the very end, Braun and Joe would be out. I want Roman Reigns and Brock to be it. Brock is getting the best of Roman Reigns. I want, like, fucking literally three F5s on Roman Reigns. And right before the pin... Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins hit the ring. And they're staring over at Brock. And Roman is a little, it's fucking still out of it, but he can see through the corner of my them. And Brock doesn't know, like, I'm going for the pin. Is that cool? And Rollins and Ambrose are like, you tell me. Go for the pin. What, what are you hesitating for? You don't know we're going to do anything. So Brock is hesitant. Do I jump Ambrose and Rollins or do I just go for the pin? They're not jumping me yet. So there seems to be a mutual respect. 
Brock goes for the pin. Rollins and Ambrose jump Brock. Literally hold him. Start the beatdown. Roman starts coming too. They go to the outside. They put Brock through an announce table. They then put Brock through a second announce table. The fucking Spanish announce table after that. So the SmackDown, then the Spanish. And then they put Brock through a third table. The German fucking broadcast table. Because the tables they were putting each other through during the match, those should just be regulation. Those brown, stupid, easily combustible tables. Those are the ones that they should be using. Not the broadcast ones, because that's for the big finish. I would save those. Brock gets put through three shield power bombs through each fucking table. They put him in. Maybe even end it with a spear if you got to. Roman Reigns gets the pin. Becomes new champion. You guys know I love... Le this is me putting the business before my own likes. You guys know I'm big on Jinder Mahal. And I have him losing the championship. I'm big on Brock Lesnar. He's my favorite of them all. And I got him losing the championship. Because it makes it's best for business. And it makes for better storylines down the road. Because Roman Reigns picks up the championship. Brock is down and out. And you have Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns. The crowd is fucking ecstatic. But you really haven't seen the actual connection. They worked together. But is there an actual connection? And they're kind of just looking at each other awkwardly. So you don't really know. You're electric because they came together at least for one night. But then all of a sudden... They put out the fist, right? They got such a big reaction with two of them. Let's see the reaction in Brooklyn with all three of them. Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and then Roman Reigns. They all do the fucking shield fist pump like they're a bunch of fucking Power Rangers. The crowd would be going absolutely nuts as Roman Reigns and the old shield theme starts bursting out through Barkley Center. We fade to black and SummerSlam is off the fucking air. After that, if you don't need a cigarette and you don't even smoke, then fucking you're going to go out and buy a fucking pack because you are out of breath at that point. When that goes black, you are going to remain in your seat. You're not going to know what the fuck just happened because it was so epic. You're going to want to re-watch all of SummerSlam over. There's no sleep. You have goosebumps for the whole night. Your mind is filled with pro wrestling at that point. You're not going to bed. You saw awesome fucking epic shit. From small shit to big shit. You saw Summer Rae and Goldust get together. You saw fucking Nikki Cross Insanity debut. And kidnap Demon Baylor. Where the hell is Demon Baylor even going? You saw The Rock, Steve Austin, and Hulk Hogan return. And help Shinsuke Nakamura pass the torch to Shinsuke. You saw the Shield reuniting. You saw Sasha Banks win the championships. Ambrose and Rollins win the tag championships. Usos won the championships. New champion in Neville. Randy Orton lost in a minute. That's water cooler talk for the next morning. Fucking Ronda Rousey debuts, takes out Becky Lynch. Causes Carmella not to cash in. Literally, you could have Baron Corbin debuted his new fucking ruthless character. Taking out John Cena. Three end of days. Every fucking match had something happen. Tazawa is out of Titus Brand. Neville is in. There's no way you're going to bed. You literally have goosebumps. You're re-watching SummerSlam that night on the network. That is amplified booking. BC, you overbooked that shit. You're damn right I overbooked it. Why not? How many pay-per-views do we watch, guys, and we are so fucking just bored out of our mind, pissed off, frustrated, because you could have made it entertaining, but you chose not to. So I'm done with fucking just booking this better. No, I'm blowing WWE out of the fucking water this time. I know more than likely they're going to put together some lackluster bullshit, so I'm going to blow them out of the water up front. I'm already claiming victory. My amplified booking is going to beat theirs. You're damn right I overbooked the whole card. Why not? There's only two huge nights in WWE's calendar year. This is one of them. Treat it like that. Give us ten epic fucking moments to talk about for years to come, for decades. This is one of those nights this Sunday. That's how I booked it. But I'm just BC. What do I fucking know? Let's see what WWE actually pulls off. I honestly want an awesome show. I hope they pull off some fun, epic, cool moments, fun matches, 
entertain us, intrigue us, set us up for the future, give us cliffhangers, give us debuts, give us surprises, give us epic moments. We need all of that on one epic show. That's what you have to do. Simplistic. Make it happen. BC Amplified, guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow for weekend update. By the way, there's talk about Shelton Benjamin inking his contract. I'll have the, all the fucking news on that tomorrow as well. BC Amplified, we're going to drink a lot of coffee, me and Pauly here. Palm tree Pauly. I'm hoping that the sun over here, Fred, pops up because we need him. It's raining pretty bad. But we got to go get some coffee. We're going to kick today's ass. We're going to kick this weekend's ass on BC Amplified. And we'll check you later. SummerSlam!